Hello, guys. Hi, Sarah. And no, is it Sarah or Sarah? It's actually Sarah for you guys, but Sarah? it's Sarah in Germany. It's nice to meet you. But thank you for coming to do the interview. It's great. And it's great to meet you as well. I'm absolutely happy that I can do that. I'm yeah, it's fabulous. Ask me whatever you want. I'm an open book. Okay, so I want to know first, what time is it with you? <laughs> oh, here it's noon now. Okay. So in Los Angeles, it's exactly noon. Okay, so you're in Los Angeles. I was wondering because I thought you were actually in Germany. Okay, so that's fine. Because it looks really bright. <laughs> Yeah, you you're in my living room with me on my on my kitchen room table. So um I thought, you know, we're, we're talking about such a private subject, so we should yes. do it in my in my home. That's it feels right. Good, actually. Definitely. Okay, Sarah. So Sarah, sorry, Sarah. <laughs> so you're a very inspirational woman and you've recovered from your eating disorder. And so how long yes. did you live with bulimia for? Oh, for 12 years. 12 I started years. even before I turned 14. I was on my first crash diet when I was 12. And then you know how it goes. You slightly slide into having an eating disorder. And before you know it, you're right there. Okay, so do you know what started it? Um, for me, it was just always a lingering feeling of not being good enough. Mm -hmm. So I remember just being an extremely sad and lonely teenager. So when I was very young, I was just a little overweight. It wasn't even mm -hmm. that, that bad. I just had a feeling, and I don't know why or what started it, but weight was always equal to um, to being lovable, to deserve love, all of that. So I thought if I just lose the weight, then I will be popular and people will like me and I will have more friends and all of that. And when you're when you're that, you're, you're still a kid, you know, mm -hmm. you're not really a young adult yet. So you fall for that idea pretty easily and it just sticks with you. Mm -hmm. And so it progressed on and so you just started to restrict your food intake from there? Yes. So um, I, of course, just Googled diets and everything. Mm -hmm. You know, you can find everything that is yeah. just so crazy on the Internet these days. So I thought, oh, yes, OK, I'm going to cut out all the sugar, all the carbs, all whatever. And so, of course, I could do that for a couple of weeks. I was actually pretty good at it. Um, and then my body just couldn't take it. So I think my first binge was was really from my body just crying for help because I didn't understand that I gave no nutrients or whatever to my to my body uh -huh. and that I dropped the weight, but I also dropped everything else that is necessary to mm -hmm. keep me going. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, and then you know how it is. Then you have like these periods where you eat a lot and then you feel sorry because you, you jeopardize all the great weight loss you had. And so you go from restricting to overeating, restricting, overeating. And then one day, I just felt so guilty after after overeating that I just couldn't live with myself. I felt so disgusted with myself that I just went and I tried to throw up. And in the beginning, it was really, you know, not easy to do because the first time you try to throw up, you're like, uh, 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 why is this not coming out? Yeah. And um, so it was terrible. It was painful. But still, it was not as painful for me as the thought of, oh, my God, I might get fat and then everybody hates me again and mm -hmm. I might never fall in love. And, you know, all the stuff that you tell yourself. So how long did that go on for then, like the actual binging and purging? I mean, did you start off with um, like a kind of anorexia or, then, or did it just kind of progress into bulimia? No, I've always had a huge love for food. Mm -hmm. So also me coming from Germany, food is a huge part of our culture. Mm -hmm. So in Europe, there is a lot of um, social activity that is always going on with food. So nobody just meets and sits around randomly. No, you meet for lunch or dinner or whatever. And then you sit there for a couple of hours, actually. Mm -hmm. So I loved food. And then I thought, I might as well just have it. And then act like it never happened by throwing up. So I, I cultivated that thought and for some time in the first few weeks, to be honest, it felt amazing. It felt like I had discovered this big secret and now I can trick my body. And since I didn't have a lot of friends and I was very insecure about myself, it was like being the tiniest club in the world, which is mm -hmm. just me and my bulimia. And so everything that I didn't have social wise, so my disease became my best friend that mm -hmm. was like right there. Whenever I felt lonely and whenever I felt bad about myself, it was just 
eating to to numb all of these feelings and then throwing up it's like a comfort for you Mm -hmm. yes Mm -hmm. it was my drug of choice so Mm -hmm. when i talk about bulimia i always call it an addiction because for me that's what it was because i have other friends that have been addicts to substances like um, cocaine or um, alcohol or whatever and when we talk about our struggles it's amazing how similar it is that they find themselves at home and they feel lonely and they feel bad and they don't know how to cope with these feelings so they drink a bottle of wine Mm-hmm. So when I feel, when I went home and I felt so lonely and isolated, I thought, well, bulimia is always there for me. If I just eat enough and do that and that, I don't have to feel like this. For for a couple of hours, my brain was just silent. Mm-hmm. When when on the rest of the day was always overthinking everything. So that's what it was for me. It okay. became my best friend pretty quickly. Mm-hmm. So it was like a comfort for you at the start, and then. Yeah. Um, so you could probably say that you kind of liked it, liked it at the start, like you enjoyed sort of binging and purging in that sense? At the beginning, mm-hmm. yes. It mm-hmm. feels so weird today to mm-hmm. say that, but to be absolutely honest, yes, I liked it in the beginning. And it took me, I would say, years to understand that I had no control over this anymore. And there was actually one day where I really understood. Um, I felt physically very sick. And I was at, at my house. The last thing I wanted to do was go out and get food and binge and purge because I felt sick already. And then I weirdly enough realized over the course of the day, I got more and more anxious and nervous. My hands were sweaty. And I was like, what is this? Why am I like this right now? There is no reason for me to be that weird going on. Like I had my, my heart pounding and I was like, what is this? I really couldn't define it. Until I finally went out, even feeling sick as a dog, I finally went out and I got food and I binged and I purged and everything calmed down. Okay. And that was the moment when I found myself being an addict. I was like, oh my God, this were withdrawal symptoms. My body was so used to having this at a certain time of the day. It was so conditioned to all of this that I realized there was not really a choice to be made. And that was a huge deal for me to realize I have no choice in this matter anymore. Was that the turning point for you then to sort of try and seek help from there? I would love to say yes, Mm -hmm. but no. Um, I was very aware of the fact what's happening to me. um, And it insecured me for a little while because I like to be in control. I like to make the choices. Um, That's a huge deal for me. I'm a control freak. Mm -hmm. Um, But I didn't try to get help at the time, no. Actually, and that might sound very harsh, um, it got worse and worse over the years till a point where my hair fell out, my skin got so dry that I had to, you know, rub on lotion twice a day. Um, My teeth were hurting terribly. I was on painkillers all of the time. Um, My fingernails didn't grow anymore. My my skin got really bad also in my face, Um, but I still didn't stop. And I actually made peace with the fact that bulimia would kill me one day. I was so isolated in my little world that there was not a lot of life to give up. And then also I was extremely depressed and I didn't even realize that because what what happens to your brain when you're starving it from nutrients the whole time and you don't go out enough, you don't ever move and stuff like that, you get so depressed without even knowing it. So Mm -hmm. there was a point where I asked myself, was I depressed first and mm-hmm. then became bulimic or was it the other way around? And I consulted my family. I said, how do you remember me before I had that disease? And they said, well, actually, you were funny. You mm-hmm. were actually pretty happy and all of that stuff. And then the more I looked into it, I realized, OK, so as the disease progressed, so did my depression. So life meant less and less to me, actually. So dying was not such a huge deal, Mm -hmm. if I may say so. So how many times a day do you think you were, you know, like binging and purging when at your worst? At my worst, Mm -hmm. at least five or six times a day. Mm -hmm. I did practically nothing else, especially on the weekends when there was nothing else to do. I just couldn't handle loneliness. So Mm -hmm. it was more or less... Um, a cycle of sleeping. In my worst, I slept like 11 or 12 hours a day because my body was so exhausted. My metabolism was down to pretty much zero. So I was always tired. And 
going to the supermarket and just getting all the food was then still the biggest deal. And, you know, after some time, you visit several supermarkets because you don't want it to look suspicious. Yeah. Because in your head, you, you approach a supermarket like you're robbing a bank, right? You know exactly. <laughs> oh, my God. And then you come up, I came up with stories when I went to the register and they looked at me and they obviously saw that I'm <laughs> overweight, but I buy all of this crap, crappy food. And um, so I always made up stuff like I'm having a party, I'm having <laughs> friends over, it's a bachelorette, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. I turned into a liar, like, oh my God, it was crazy. And, you know, then you take your food and you run home. And that's it. You're not planning on leaving the mm -hmm. house. I even have my cell phone on silent and it was just me and movies and my eating disorder and all of this food and not thinking about nothing. So it was total addict behavior. It is a lonely existence so when you're doing that, you know, like it is just you and the food and that's when it yeah. comes down to and you do like there is a lot of lies that, you know, get told, you know, to like try and hide, hide yeah. it, you know, if somebody's coming back into the apartment or, you know, it's just scary, you know, to think of if they if you get caught out at that point. Yeah, it's very scary. Um, so for me, I had times in my life where I was living with my with my life partner, mm -hmm. and he had no idea that was going on because I timed everything perfectly. So I knew he was coming home from work about four o'clock in the afternoon. I was coming home at two. So on my way home, I stopped at two different supermarkets, bought the stuff. Um, have my my little session and then threw up and then mm -hmm. took all of the stuff that was left on evidence and uh, brought it down to the trash so he would not find all of the wraps and papers in in our trash and that went on for two years like that so you can hide it so well and i mean we all know that within mm -hmm. a year or two you're an expert you're a mm -hmm. pro you you <laughs> avoid situation where it could even come up you don't really meet with friends for dinner or whatever. You just, at least I didn't. I always said, oh, I'm busy. I meet you afterwards when you're going to the bar or whatever mm -hmm. stuff. Stuff. And um, I can say for 12 years, no problem getting caught, unfortunately. You know, it's like I talked about it with my mom once very early in the beginning. And we were seeking help, actually. And then she got into a huge fight with the person we were seeking help at. And the person was really extremely unsensitive. And from that point, we never returned. So all she did was she said, you know what? I'm going to buy healthy food for you so you don't have to throw up. It's all going to be fine. And from that, we both acted like it never happened. So 12 years is a long time to be living with bulimia. And you've already went through the side effects and stuff, you know, with your teeth and your skin and your hair and stuff like that. It's very detrimental to your body. Um, did you? So when was it that you decided to really seek help with it? So uh, two years ago, I moved to Los Angeles with my little son, Louis. He was eight months at the time. And because when I, I got even more lonely because I didn't know a single person here. And the pressure was so high um, that I got worse than I ever was before. So it was all just binging, purging, all of that stuff um, and not really leaving any food in my body. So mm -hmm. I passed out several times. And uh, one time I fell down the stairs and I cracked two of my ribs. So I had to go to the hospital several times. And they told me as a single mom, they have to inform Child Protective Services if you are unable to take care of your infant. And that was the turning point for me when they told me they're going to take away my son until I get better. So I promised them to immediately seek help. And that's how I ended on your website, because it was really the thought of really going into a treatment center was mm -hmm. too much for me at the time. Mm -hmm. Also, I didn't want it to leave my son at home with somebody else or who knows what might have happened. So I'm all about information. As I mentioned, I'm a control freak. I like mm -hmm. to be in control and I like to understand things. So what attracted me to your program was the fact that it clearly stated you will understand your disease once you read this. And mm -hmm. at the same time, you will find a huge network of, of support. And both of these things seem to be a perfect combination for me. So when I signed up, I read the book within three days and it changed my entire outlook on my disease. And it also explained to me why I was never able to make it out on my own before, because I had no idea about what it really does to my body, that there are mind binges, that there are body binges, all of that stuff. It explains so much to me. 
and then also being able to blog about my struggles and getting actual responses and, and reading their blog entries, it all of a sudden opened up a whole new world for me and I didn't feel so alone with it anymore. So whenever I felt really bad, I just pulled out my iPhone and I blogged about it and I said, I, I feel like I'm, I'm losing it, I can't make it through this day. Mm -hmm. And then you get three responses back within an hour and you know they've all been there and we can all make it. Mm -hmm. So that was, a, a, it made such an impact on me. I can't even tell you how much I love all of these people that blog there on a daily basis from afar. They are more familiar to me than the people that I meet here every day. So going back to um, like your work, because you are in the limelight, you're um, a celebrity. In, in Germany and now you're over in Los Angeles and you're you're a celebrity and actress now and you've got like your you've published your own book now about your your story your life story yeah is that right um so going back to yeah. the limelight this has been so when did you come to the limelight do you think your bulimia kind of it, that's associated with it or or not really so I don't think that my eating disorder had anything to do with my um line of work mm -hmm. just because I started um, being on red carpets and really being on television and all of that stuff when I was 17. Mm -hmm. That was already three years in. But what is kind of interconnected is that when you have bulimia, you have something that I call the autopilot. It's where you are functioning and going through motions in society so nobody realizes what's going on with you. And so I did what we all kind of do. I created the second persona. And she's not as sensitive as I am. She's not as insecure as I am. No, no, she's really strong. And she she looks like the world can do nothing to her. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that got me a career in television. But it's nothing different than when some people just go out to the office every day and they look like the happy girl and the mm -hmm. strong girl and the intelligent girl. And then they come home and they just break down and they find comfort in their disease. So... I did it in front of a camera, but millions of women do it every day in an office or whatever kind of environment. Mm -hmm. We all have our autopilot. That's why most of our friends and family are so shocked when we finally come out and say, you know what, that has been going on for me for years and mm -hmm. you had no idea, but I'm choosing to tell you now. Mm -hmm. But everything that I heard and also the contacts I made on the website and on your program, these are all incredible women. They are smart. They are funny. They achieved so much in life. They run families. They are mothers. They are so impressive. Um, and there's such a stigma in society that bulimia people are like losers and they don't have their life under control and whatnot. And it's the complete opposite. That's what I found out. Mm -hmm. It's the people you think they would never do that that have it. Mm hmm Wow. Yeah. So we're moving into like the actual recovery itself. Um, and, you know, you were you were talking about the physical urges and the emotional urges to binge. Um, so this is what so you went through the read the book and you were like following um, the structure of the book. And did you do structured yes. eating? Did you? I did do structured mm -hmm. eating. So um, what helped me very much is the understanding of nutrients and binges. Mm -hmm. So um, I went for the first couple of days when I decided to finally end this um, and I got a lot of juices also. So um, what I did once I understood that my binges are controlled by uh, a lack of nutrients mm -hmm. is, oh my God, how can I flood my body with as many nutrients as I can? So here in Los Angeles, right in my neighborhood in the same street, there is a place for juicing which is not juicing in the regular sense of like restricting yourself. Mm -hmm. It's just an add on because you, you know, all of that stuff that they put into the juice, it's good for you, but it's just an add on to your regular diet. Mm -hmm. So um, I had that in the morning because I still have problems having breakfast. My body wasn't used to it yet. So I most of the time had like an egg and a little bit of toast and a little bit of fat and this juice and my body slowly got used to that and I was eating every three hours in the beginning and then later every four and I had snacks with me all the time and also during my busy days I found amazing snacks that are very very healthy that you can have in your little purse or whatever with you all the time it's actually funny because they are these little squeezy bags that my son had when he was two 
and um, that is like a puree of things so whenever mm -hmm. I felt my blood sugar dropping or I felt I get anxious because I need to eat something do something I just had one of these things from my purse and then had enough time to go and get a healthy salad somewhere but in the beginning it was a huge adjustment and a huge struggle and I had my little tricks to not get frustrated over over weight gain or anxious about food and um, I, I could like go on for for hours but one <laughs> thing I did is I threw away all of the clothes that didn't really fit me you know all of these clothes that you buy one size too small mm -hmm. because ooh, 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 one day you're gonna fit mm -hmm. in there and then the world mm -hmm. is gonna be a perfect place <laughs> guess what first of all not gonna happen mm -hmm. and if it's happening not worth it Nobody loves you more because you love you have one clothing size less mm -hmm. and you might kill yourself over that. It's an illusion. So I realized one of the clothing items that really mess up my day are jeans. Jeans are so mean and unforgiving. Yeah. <laughs> I hate them. So I just threw away all of my jeans in a rage. I went to my to my closet and threw them all away and I went out and I bought leggings. I, I have one here. Look. That was the first one I got. Oh, yes. We call them like jeggings. They're like, yes. so, yeah. It's a, it's a denim legging. Yeah. And it's so comfortable. And I thought to myself, if such a thing as leggings exist, why would I torture myself into a jeans ever again if mm -hmm. it makes me sad first thing in the morning? Mm -hmm. I just realized also through the book and the community, why do I make my feel myself make me so so bad why why would i buy clothes that are too small because i feel i should fit in there mm -hmm. i shouldn't i'm fine and my body will feel will balance itself into a natural weight and it did but it doesn't happen overnight and while it does so i will just wear leggings and they will grow and mm -hmm. shrink just as i will I love your attitude towards it. That's the attitude that's needed yeah. for recovery, definitely, and commitment. Yeah. And you know, like to start like self acceptance and start to love yourself. Yeah. Um, and so, in terms of the actual concept itself, like um, using food as you know to actually re recover, um, can seem quite um, the opposite for like people who are with bulimia because they think that they're actually eating when they're binging and purging so much. So, in terms of that they're not getting enough nutrients, you know, like can seem like they can get baffled from that. Did you find that or did you, or did it sort of resonate with you quite quickly? It resonated with me quite quickly. Once I did a little research on the fact that um, fat and sugar is observed first and then it needs to go through your whole colon and everything to get out the nutrients. So what happens when we are binging and purging is we do keep on a lot of calories that I had no idea about, which is just, it blew my mind, which also explained why I was never really that skinny. So you get all of these calories, let's say five, six, seven hundred per binge and purge, even if you throw up, um, but it's fat and sugar. So it's calories your body can do nothing with. So you get the worst and you throw up, throw up and everything that you could actually use to also metabolize it is going out the window again. So I was like, this whole concept occurs to me as useless now because it's not, take, it's not, it's not getting me skinny. It's not keeping me skinny. It doesn't give me any energy to even work out. So this is not beneficial. And so I, I just tried it. I just had a leap of, like, I just gave it some faith. I said, okay, I'm going to do this for four weeks now. I'm going to stick with it absolutely and see what happens. And um, I had a little bloating in the beginning. Of course, uh, there were days when I looked half pregnant. But the matter of fact was I quickly started losing weight. So I had a little weight gain in the beginning, but it came off. The, the healthier I got with what I ate, the more it came off. And that, I, I really couldn't believe it. Mm -hmm. Until to a point where I trusted in the method and I just threw away my scale and I've never been ha happier than not having a scale in my life mm -hmm. anymore. Scales are absolutely useless, and I tell my a lot of my coaches, you know, like definitely trash the scale as soon as they're entering yep. into recovery, because it's that number on the scale, yeah, no matter what, it's just yeah, it doesn't matter about the number on the scale, and it goes up and down anyway. You can jump on in the morning, and then like a couple of hours yep. later, it'll be up a couple of pounds, and it causes panic. Um, so yeah, so it's like cleaning out your recovery journey. 
Um, so in terms of, okay, so you 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 started the, the physical urges to binge and then like the Blue Me Help method, we then move on to like the emotional urges to binge. Did you, did you have any problems with like, um, like habits? Obviously, you know, like as you um, progress, you've had it for 12 years, um, it, yeah. it comes triggering the habits are there. So like in the evening when you're alone, there might be triggers. Yeah. Did you, how did you come, how did you manage to get past those ones? <coughs> so... That was actually harsh. Mm -hmm. That was um, the more emotional part of me. And uh, I still could start crying about it because I'm still, um, how they say, clean my side of the street, which means I try mm -hmm. to keep emotional triggers away. And I realized that reject rejection just from people that are very unsensitive that I had in my life was my biggest trigger. Mm -hmm. Some people they did not realize how easily I get hurt by their comments or their behavior. Also because the facade I had put up for the world was such a strong one that they always thought, oh, we can say pretty much everything to Sarah and she doesn't need any help because she has everything under control. So of course not. The little kid inside of me still got so hurt on a daily basis. Um, so I had to let go of certain people in my life. I had to let go of these people, the hipsters, the, the popular kids, all of that, that always require from you being so perfect. Um, I didn't want to do it anymore. So that was the first thing. Then also, over the 12 years, I had um, a bulimia habit. I came home, I watched the same TV show, I had my binge, I threw up, I had a cup of tea, I went to bed. So that was the least, that was in the good days where it was only once a day. Um, and I realized I cannot sit down in the same spot on my couch, watch the same TV series at the same time and not have the binge because my mind and my body were so conditioned to it. So it were simple things. I just switched the couch around. I changed um, my feng shui in my room mm -hmm. um, and I just made it a new living room and promised myself to never ever have a binge spot in this living room. I would say if you have to get rid of your couch, because that's where you always binge, you might want to get rid of your couch. At least for me, that helped a lot because it was also a commitment to myself where I said, okay, couch, you and I, we had a lot of, lot of bad binge sessions. Um, this part of my life is over. You remind me of it too much. You got to go. <laughs> so that helped a lot for me. And yes. meditation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I had to realize, oh my God, now I don't have that comfort and, and addiction behavior anymore to slow down my thoughts. What's the other way to do that? What's the other way to center me and to get me in check? And for me, that was meditation and moving towards uh, spiritual growth. So that has nothing to do with a certain religion. It has to do with educating your thoughts, which was extremely important for me because I had so many thoughts of um, self-hatred in me. Whenever I looked in the mirror, it was never good enough. Whenever I looked at anything else I did in life, it was never good enough. As a mother, never good enough. So I never really learned how to love myself before I committed to actually train it like a muscle. So loving yourself, you train it like a muscle because for so long you were so used to hating yourself that you really have to, to get there. So first of all, it was a simple thought in the morning where you don't feel like, oh my God, I look like shit. You say, you know what? You're fine. You're fine. We're going to put on these leggings and we're going to go out there and we're going to be decent, nice human beings and people are going to love us for being decent. And that's what made all the difference for me. Once I learned how to be a positive person, I attracted so many wonderful people into my life that it automatically got easier being myself. That's great. I, lo I love it. It's fantastic. Um, so it can also be like the sort of all or nothing black and white thinking that can come into play as well. You know, like a lot of these things do trigger you off. Like, for instance, you know, you do look in the mirror and like um, it could be like, oh, you know, instant thoughts and it could it could spiral out of control and enter the into a binge purge. Yeah. Um, I do try and tell my coach exactly what you said there. You you put it a lot better. Just fantastic, you know. Um, exactly that. You got to love yourself. You got to embrace yourself. You, you, the negative self talk is not going to get you anywhere in life. It's just um, yeah. self destructive in that way. And it's trying to change that because some people can live with that ne negative self talk for countless many years. Um, and it's just like you're saying, it's like exercising that muscle or um, 
changing that habit and like you have to really reinforce it and it is challenging you know you have to just continually you'll hear it hear it coming and even the diet mentality coming and going actually I'm gonna have to fight against that you know that thought's coming in and it's and you have to battle against it so yeah it's it's um but that's fabulous yeah you know what I heard, and it was a wonderful thing to hear that. So once I moved on on my spiritual journey, just to also find myself and to find ways how to cope with life in a healthy way, um, I really took that really serious. And I went to see an Indian guru. He was here in California, yes. And he was one of my spiritual leaders. I, I Googled mm-hmm. all of his videos and read his books and stuff like that. And then he finally came around and I had a chance to talk to him. And I talk, told him about, you know, all of these negative thoughts that are so stuck in my head because they've been there since I could remember. And he said, you know, Sarah, sometimes you just got to remind yourself not everything you think is true. <laughs> it's just something that your environment told you very early on through television and magazines and all of that. But that's who, who, did, who did ever come around and say everything you think is true? So now every time I have a thought that's like really heavy on my mind and impacting my mood or triggering me, I look at it, I literally look at it in my head and I'm like, this is just a thought. Mm -hmm. Nothing's, nothing's really necessary to act on it now. It's a thought, it's unpleasant, but that's all it is. And it will be gone in 15 minutes. So let's just give it these 15 minutes. And most of the time, that's all it takes. And then sometimes if it really hits me hard, I do a little grounding meditation for 15 minutes, Mm -hmm. just telling myself, I get over this 15 minutes at a time and you get over every binge urge that you have. I Mm -hmm. promise you, Mm -hmm. you will go, you will get so good at it that you find this place of peace in your head like that when you need it. I've come down to a point where I manage the most stressful situations by just sometimes when I'm in the car between meetings. I just take 10 minutes in the parking lot and I have a guided meditation on my phone and I center myself because I know I will have the next meeting in a coffee shop where everybody around me is eating cake and and whatever, whatnot, what is not beneficial for me at the moment. And I'm absolutely immune to it. Once your mind finally shuts up, you will be so peaceful that you don't need anything to mask life for you anymore. Mm -hmm. That acceptance is very important because a lot of the time when the binge urges come by, you find that the, most people are actually running away from it because it's a very uncomfortable sensation yeah. um, that comes over you. So they run away from it. And with that, they, they it's like a trigger and it's straight to the fridge or straight to whatever yeah. and just trying to sort of like shove down the feeling with food and trying to block it out. You know, yeah. and that sort of trance that you can go into, you know, the kind of the, the numbness that people describe yeah. is yeah. trying to block out. But being mindful to it is like so important for recovery. You know, become mindful to it and accepting that um, what it is and actually drawn, um, coming into your body and going, okay, where is it? Where is that sensation? Is it in my mind? Is it in my shoulders? Is it, you know, like right down into your, you know, your feet? And yeah, um, yeah and it's actually just sitting with it for that 10 minutes and then... Um, you know, like, yeah, I love it, you know, like the meditation, anything that can sort of help in that sense as well, you know, can really, um, as long as you're not just like going straight into the, you know, the fridge, whatever, just delay, just delay for 10, 15 minutes. Yeah, it's so important. And what it actually does for you is you get back your sense of power. Mm. Because with every time that you try to overcome bulimia and you fail, and I, b- before I discovered your method and before I really committed to it, there were days where I got up and I said, okay, this is Monday. This is my first day of my new life. I'm going to make it. I'm going to make it. It was like 7 a.m. And I was done making it by 12. So I, I got so insecure about myself and, the, and it had more and more doubts about myself because I couldn't even make it for four hours. Are you kidding mm. me? So you finally come to the conclusion, okay, I'm going st- to be stuck with this disease forever which is an absolute lie and not true. Mm -hmm. So whenever I just made it through a couple of hours more and I was able to get myself into this peaceful place, I realized, did you you hear that? So whenever I was was, um, getting myself into this peaceful place through meditation, I realized I can do this. I do have power over this. Mm -hmm. And so my self-confidence came back 
little by little every time, just how it left me little by little every time by failing. You can turn this around. It will be the exact same thing. You are not a victim of this disease if you not choose to be. You just have to find the right instrument for you. Mm -hmm. And then you realize it's all just in your head. So once you got that straight, that this is not stronger than you, there's almost nothing in the world that can knock you off your feet anymore. That's right. Um, in terms of the binge urges themselves, when it goes into like a physical urge to binge, you know, your body's actually really seeking out nutrients and it's um, going to do everything it can to actually get those nutrients. Um, so, you know, like I always say this to my coaches, it's like putting a glass of water in front of you and saying you're not allowed to drink that water for two days. And then, you know, like going, okay, Sarah, don't drink the water, don't drink the water. You'll drink the water for survival. It's the exact yeah. same thing for food. You know, you cannot like um, try, you know, you cannot live your life like running away from food. You've got to make peace with food. You've got to make, food's got to become your friend so yeah. you can move on and like, you know, live, live happily. Mm -hmm. So for me, I knew just because um, I was used after 12 years, you can eat crazy amounts of food you know you're you're that's what you're used to so i stocked up my entire house with um apples vegetables cauliflower all the stuff that i actually like and i said okay if i feel the anxiety to overeat every now and then it will happen but it will happen on healthy food because just to break it down also into you know a bulimic logic it was like okay I can binge and throw up and my body gets no benefits from it and I still have eaten 600 calories. That's not that's not good. So how can I at least maybe overeat and, and calm myself down a little bit because it will happen to you in the beginning, it will. Um, but do it in a way so that I at least, at least pack a lot of nutrients so that it actually gets me somewhere my body can recover. Mm -hmm. So there were times where I just ate seven apples until no more apples were fitting into my body. Is that nice? No, is that perfect? No, but you're recovering bulimic. You're not going to be perfect from, from zero to hero. And that there are so many gray zones in recovery was such an important thing for me to allow myself that. Because before that, it was always, oh, it's all or nothing. If I now, mm -hmm. if I now mess it up, I might as well just throw the towel because I already messed up. No, everything that gets a little bit better a little bit better you're gonna see progress you just have to give yourself a little while and yeah there might be days where you eat seven apples like an idiot but that's just what you do and still kudos to you for even trying so pat yourself on the back mm. a little bit even if it wasn't the perfect day and um, in terms of like moving forward into the intuitive eating or like maybe perhaps introducing more of the trigger foods into your home, how did you go about that? So that was a step-by-step -step thing. Mm -hmm. um, surprisingly enough, I realized I don't even like my binge foods that much. Mm -hmm. So I was a binger on ice cream and cereal and all of that stuff. And now that I'm eating normal, I allow it to myself every now and then. And I can tell you, it has completely lost its charm. So now that my taste buds are going back to normal by eating healthy food, first of all, I find myself craving healthy food. I love getting um, salads. I love eating chicken breast, um, all of that stuff. And if I do have chocolate every now and then, just because I can, just because that's normal, I don't like it that much. It seems extremely sweet to me. Mm -hmm. um, all of that stuff is not that attractive to me anymore. And it has no power over me anymore. It doesn't make me feel better or worse. It's just a chocolate bar. And if you were like going back in time, looking at your future self, how do you think your 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 person in the past would respond to to what you just said there? Would you have believed that you would have come this far and like recovered from it? So I'm the most unlikely case of recovery because I can even say, first of all, I had no fear of death. I would have died with this disease. That's how much I was connected to it. I never thought that there would be a day in my life where I say food has no impact on my mood. It doesn't. Um, so 
that's just a year into recovery. I thought I would have to live with that struggle forever because in the, in the first few months, it's a struggle. And I thought it would always stay like that. And I thought it would never get easier. But actually, after the first three months, the development was so rapid into feeling so much better um, that there were only a couple of rough days and, and sometimes a week in between. But you get through this because it's really once you have the tools and the the trust in yourself that you got through it already so many days why not another day why not another day and before you see it you're back to normal and you don't have the urge but if that would have i wouldn't have believed it a year ago no way i would have said no you don't know me i need this disease it's my best friend it's Mm -hmm. my family I don't know how to cope with life other than that. Because let's face it, before I went into recovery, I never lived a single day as an adult without the help of my so-called best friend, bulimia. So it was, I didn't know how a life without it would look like. I would have never known that it's so beautiful. I do so many things for the first time because I came back into life. I allow myself to feel stuff and to experience stuff. I'm not that tired anymore. I'm not afraid of going out with people anymore. And I'm not hating myself for eating a Big Mac. It sometimes happens. And you know what? Nothing happens. You (laughs) eat a Big Mac and the next day you don't. And that's just it. And it's wonderful. And I wish everybody would know that, that that's going to happen to you pretty fast. So that's a big fear for a lot of people. I mean, we sent out the email um, a couple of weeks ago about this. See, what's your biggest fear? And that came back yeah. quite a lot because I went through like over 300 emails so checking each one. And that was a big one. It was like um, fear of not having it in your life anymore. Fear there's going to be a void. Um, yeah. So what is your advice to people then of, of that fear of how to get over that? So you know what I did? I literally made myself a list of things for the first few weeks that I wanted to um, fill this gap that bulimia leaves. Because when you're bulimic, it pretty much takes off half of your day, right? I mean, you spend hours binging, purging, and then you sleep much more. So it's like having a half-time job, right? It's a part-time job. So I thought, okay, I need to do two things. I need a hobby and I need actual friends. So I made it my goal to replace this false friend bulimia with actual people. I went out and I promised to myself the first person I meet that wants to be my friend and wants to connect. I'm going to be totally honest about my struggles from day one. And I never regretted it. And so these people stayed in my life. And whenever I had a little setback, I was honest about that too. It's about um, taking responsibility. I realized by not telling anybody when I had a setback or when I uh, was not eating right and not being on my program, um, it's so easy to not feel responsible, really, to just ignore it. But if you go out and you tell people about it, especially the ones you love and they love you, and you'd be like, hey, I had a setback, then it becomes real. This happened. We cannot just ignore it. And it makes it so much easier for you to get back on track. And then also going out, having hobbies, going for walks, being in the sun more, not isolate yourself anymore. You will go out of your comfort zone a little bit, more and more and more, and then all of a sudden you find yourself on the beach on a Friday afternoon and you'll be like, I'm actually here. I would normally spend money on food that I'm going to throw up for useless stuff, for torturing myself. When right now I'm here sitting on the beach with people who accept me exactly the way I am and I'm having a blast. So you will experience a lot of things for the first time ever maybe, which is, I can't even compare it to anything, but you're really going to come out of recovery as a totally new person with much less hurting in your life. And in terms of... Let me, how, how can we put this? What is the biggest like um, accomplishment and or the best sort of positive aspect of recovery that you can think of? And it's hard because there's so many. No, actually for me personally, it was just quietness in my brain. I remember one day I, w- I went for a walk with my son and we stopped at Pinkberries because he loves it and he's allowed to have ice cream once a week. So, you know, it's... <laughs> Sends him on a little sugar high, but you know, sometimes you got to do that. 
So we went to Pinkberries and we both had ice cream and we were just sitting there in peace. And then we went home and he went for a nap. And I found myself on the couch and I, and I said, oh my God, it's been like five hours since I had a huge bowl of ice cream and I didn't think about it one second. That's all it was. It was a bowl of ice cream. It doesn't make me anything less or more than I was before. And that was the biggest accomplishment for me. That when, while I was bulimic, 80% of my thinking at least were about food, about weight and about my appearance and all of that stuff, all of these circles of negative, negative thinking. That they are gone now frees up so much space in your head for loving behavior, for being a better friend, a better mother, a better everything, because now all of a sudden you learned how to love yourself, which enables you to give more love out into the world. Because that is a saying that is ever true. You have to love yourself first before you can truly give love to other people. And that's what we're here for. That's what we're born for, so that we can go through the world and just make it a better place. Otherwise, I can think of no other reason why we're here. <laughs> it's lovely. Um, so moving with your, your career, now that you've recovered um, f from bulimia, do you think like, I mean, obviously, it definitely is going to have a massive impact, but like you're an actress, right? So do, do you think yes. that you're, because you're more open and recovered from bulimia, do you find that you are able to perform better? Um. So I have an acting coach here in LA who sees me once a week and I'm uh, in his master class and we are working with a lot of famous people. So it's a really hard class to get in. And at least my acting coach says ever since I have let it, have let go of all of these feelings of shame and all of this uh, covering up of what I really am, he said he sees a whole new side in me. And I can also tell it as a writer because uh, my book about bulimia was my second book already. And it was much more successful than the first one. Um, all the critics loved it. We had 82 news outlets reporting about this story and praising the book that normally would never touch a subject like bulimia or eating disorders. We changed the whole outlook that Germany, Austria and Switzerland had on this topic within four weeks of PR tour. Wow, and amazing. the people were kind and the people were lovely. They all read the book before they actually showed up to interview me. Um, I still get uh, a crazy amount of emails every day from girls that read the book and now are encouraged to come out and seek help because we broke down barriers with that. I just was so sick of people having such a stigma to bulimia. Mm -hmm. Whenever someone says I'm anorexic, then people, they feel pity. Mm -hmm. When you said I'm bulimic, People feel grossed out. That's what it is. They don't understand. So I wanted to change that. And I remember writing on one of my last blog entries. I remember writing, oh, my God, girls, you, you guys mean so much to me. I just wish the world would be like our community is here. Why cannot the whole world be like this? And then one day I was sitting at the beach and I thought, well, if I want the whole world to be like this, I might as well start. So why not be brave enough to put it out there? And the book is brutally honest about all the ugly sides of bulimia, how you got into it um, and how I feel about myself while I do it. All of that, it's very, very detailed and it's pretty much half of it is just my journal. So I put it out there unfiltered for the world to see and just hoping with all of my heart that they would understand and they did. And it opened up the doors to be finally able to say, I have this problem, that doesn't mean I'm a bad person, I'm also not gross, that is all not how you picture it, and please love me for what I am and help me. Um, so yeah, so this is, this is the book, um, it's actually quite an interesting cover I think, because when we thought about um, how you, what kind of book cover do you choose for a book like Bulimia. Mm -hmm. So um, you can either just have your face on it, which is a little weird because it looks like every book and this is not every book. Mm -hmm. and Or you can have a very sad person sitting on the floor with a lot of food, yeah. which is also <laughs> not us. Yeah. So um, when I met with the artist, I said, let's use plaster instead of clothes. And please put it on my neck really tight and then we wait for half an hour until it dries. Because that moment when you feel like in a second I can't move anymore, 
that's how I think bulimia feels once you're trapped. And um, actually, the people loved the cover. So uh, the book was a huge hit, and I felt so honored and and so motivated to do more. Mm -hmm. So I came back home, and I asked all my fellow showbiz friends um, if they would show up for free on a, on a movie set to do a movie about bulimia. Mm -hmm. And uh, sometimes, you know, as if you... If you're a believer like I am, sometimes when you're on the right track, life sends you help. So I got contacted by a Hollywood producer lady who produced over 20 movies. Her name is Annabelle, and she has German roots, and she got her hands on my book. And she's living in L.A., and she said, can I help you in any kind of way? I had bulimia 10 years ago. I want to help. And I said, you are heaven sent. Would you produce a short movie with me? And we would normally never be able to afford her, of course, mm -hmm. but she's in it just because just me like me just for the cost. So I wrote a short script, which actually um, already made it into some competition. So we have a brilliant script. We have a great crew that will show up um, and it will be a movie about one day in my life when I still had an eating disorder. When I was on movie sets in the morning and throwing up and crying at night and nobody knew what was happening to me. And I was scared to death that anybody would find out. And it also includes my way into the eating disorder. When I was a little girl and I just felt wrong, I just felt not good enough. And I think that's a feeling that teenagers have these days now more than ever. So my plan is to produce this movie and nobody, you know, it's a nonprofit thing. Nobody takes any money from it. And then we go and we send it out to high schools and schools and uh, social workers for free so they can show it to the kids. And whoever invites us, we're going to travel to the high schools and sit down with, a, you know, a whole gymnasium of kids <laughs> and watch the movie together and then spend a couple of hours talking about self-esteem, not bullying each other. Also, that we're not all built equally. You can starve yourself as much as you want. You're not going to look like a Victoria's Secret model. Not, we're not built this mm -hmm. way. 99% of us will never look like this. We would have to lose like five of our ribs to look like this. <laughs> it's not normal and you don't have to. What you have to do is you have to be a decent friend, a decent human being. These are the things that are important, but unfortunately, nobody talks about it. So um, we're going to do this. We're going to take the movie to schools and uh, talk, talk with people about the fact that it's okay to be you and to take some of the pressure off them and some of these struggles and just know, let them know that it started like that for us. And then it turned for me into a 12-year hell that I barely survived. Mm -hmm. And then I want to send the movies uh, to festivals because I want the show business people to see that we have to think about every role model and every message we send out there. It's not okay to have shows like um, the next top model where they act like they snatch these girls right from the street and that's how a normal girl looks like. It's not true. It makes people sad. And their target group of audience is 10-year-old girls to 16-year-olds. And that's exactly where most of the eating disorders start. So it has, this movie will have two premises. It should prevent, educate, and break down walls. So every girl like you and me can just come out to their families or friends and be like, you know what, I have to tell you something. This is what's really going on with, with me. Please don't judge me. Please don't be mm -hmm. grossed out. Mm -hmm. Just get help with me and love me and support me because that's what we need. It's amazing. You're a very, very inspirational lady. Fantastic. I mean, if I could act, I'd definitely fly over and part of your movie. <laughs> but I'm not a very good actress. So. <laughs> we would love to have you. Actually, what I'm doing at the moment is, I mean, I hope, you know, fingers crossed, we need to get it financed with Kickstarter first, but we will be able to do the whole project for only 35000 when it's normally three times like that, wow. just because everybody's going to show up for free. Mm -hmm. So all we need to get is the permits and, you know, the cameras and all of that stuff. So um, we only cover these costs with it, but everybody else will put in knowledge and everything for free. It's a great group of people. And um, I would say more than half the people that are involved so far have a history of eating disorders, which makes it more authentic. And I think it will be a brilliant piece that I truly firmly believe can save lives. 
And um, so if you want to be in oh, it, I would love to it. be in if your movie. If anyone else on the side who sees this video wants to be in it, shoot me a message. We would love to have you on board in any kind of way that you would want to. It's all possible. My biggest dream is that us girls who have that struggle make a piece of art that ba that breaks down the boundaries and walls and builds bridges just like good art should. And that we go out there with our message into the world, not being ashamed anymore mm -hmm. because we deserve this. And so in terms of um, a recovery method for people, would you, would you recommend the bulimia help method to them? Of course I would recommend <laughs> it. I would have never even started getting into recovery without you guys, without understanding what's wrong with me, why my body reacts a certain way. Understanding what's going on with you is the first step into recovery because before you don't know why you have these urges, you feel so who should understand you if you don't even understand yourself? Just read it, just mm -hmm. just give it a try. A lot of um, the um, you know people who do come through like you know emails and stuff that we get have seen like um, psychologists and therapists and and all this in the past, but nothing's helped. Um, it, it is, they're actually not addressing the the core of the problem because it's they always saying it's not about food and in actual general it, it is a lot to do with food of uh, course. you know and it's telling somebody that is so so detrimental for their recovery you know and it's like yeah so we always get we get so many emails like every day like thank you you've saved my life thank you you've saved my life yeah. um and it, it's it's amazing it really is it's really amazing if we could actually like probably count how many emails we've we've, we've received it, we couldn't even yeah. do that you know but it would be nice to probably write them all out and they like to actually but um yeah. when it's online it's really hard because you actually don't see the person yeah. um physically so it's it's hard to imagine you know tens of thousands of people when you don't actually you know it's it's really difficult but if they're all standing in front of you you know it would be a different you know scene altogether yeah, yeah so yeah it's but oh it's just amazing that you've 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 covered you've recovered and you must be feeling absolutely amazing top of the world and you know like you've got your whole life ahead of you you know a happy life ahead of you and you're you're so you're so inspiring what you're doing to promote like you know recovery it's it's great it's really really great you know once you go into recovery it will always at least in my opinion also be a spiritual journey because um, what you did with your eating disorder is you suppressed yourself and your feelings for so long and you run on autopilot so well that you have to really figure out who am I beneath all of this. So it will be a fantastic journey back to yourself, back to the one you actually were meant to be. And you will be so eager to meet this person that this will keep you going. And so... Now I'm moving into my true self more and more with week and week. And I learned so much about myself and life again that I just needed to adjust my work a little bit. It's not just about me anymore. I never felt more useful and more in the right place and happier in my life um, as since I published this book and now try to make this movie a reality. I never felt more at home and at peace in myself so i can't even imagine stopping this i i i want to do this movie and i want to make it a reality and then i want to move on and do something else until this message has been heard everywhere and and like i said one of my biggest dreams is to just sit down with um 100 200 girls that see the movie with me together and we talk about it openly about their struggles and about their fear of being too fat already or whatnot. I mean, the statistics shows that eight out of 10 girls under the age of 10 are already afraid of being too fat. That is heartbreaking. And that could be anybody's kid and they will grow up to be anybody's mother. And if we don't learn to be in peace with ourselves, we will pass that on to our children. It mm -hmm. will become a bigger and bigger and bigger issue. So whatever I can do on my part, I will talk about this day in and day out. I have no shame. Um, I had this disease for 12 years and I take responsibility for it. And now I'm out every day. I'm out and about to make the world hopefully a little better on, on my part. 
truly inspiring. You're, I, oh, it's you. absolutely amazing. Your story is amazing. You know, like you've done so much at a very young age, and um, you know, there's the whole world in front of you, and you're just you're perfect candidate. You know, for really like getting it out there that recovery is possible. We need somebody just like you to like really, you know, like, it is possible. Yeah. But mm. The thing is, it would never have been possible for me without you and all the other guys who answered every single blog post that I made where I said, oh my God, I feel like I can't make it, I can't make it. And that's the biggest message behind all of this, I think, is Mm -hmm. we all make an impact on everybody's life once we open our hearts and we are more kind to one another. So, um, like I said, this, this whole movie idea comes down to one blog post that I had where I wrote, I wish the world would be like our community is in here. And then I just realized if we stick together, the world can be exactly that place. We just have to start it. And why not us? Why not our bullying? You know, why not we? Mm -hmm. So um, I just hope we we make it possible. I hope a lot of the guys want to be involved in what kind of matter. Mm -hmm. However, you know. It could be just an amazing project and once we will all stand there and have the film premiering and it will be 90% very strong, intelligent people that had an eating disorder once. We are not the weak ones. We are not victims. I love your idea. I think it's fantastic. It's Thank definitely so very much. exciting. And I, I definitely will, will talk to Richard and we'll fly over and <laughs> be part of it. That, you that know? would be yeah. so nice. It and you know, like I said, we can make it possible for, for very little money down. Mm-hmm. And every five dollars that everybody donates helps. So mm-hmm. whoever sees this, mm-hmm. if you could just grab yourself a heart, look at the Kickstarter campaign and talk to your friends and family about it. If we reach our goal, we could have this movie out by December. And then I will fly everywhere with it and I will get it everywhere because I'm actually in the position to do that. And I couldn't be more proud. And if you want to be involved, shoot me an email. You can reach me. I want you. I need your expertise. And this could be a life-changing thing for all of us that we can make happen to prevent other people and to free ourselves. So just if you would just go and, and donate what you normally would have spent on coffee today, that would already be a huge deal for me. So where do they go to? How do they donate? So we have a Kickstarter campaign. You can find it by typing in my name, Sarah Schetzel, or Addict. Um, it's, you're, it's, you find it at Short Movies, and I will also um, post it, and you find it on my Facebook and everywhere. And uh, there's a little video explaining exactly what we're going to do and also what the movie is about and who's already on board. And uh, then you just have a donate button, and on the side you have rewards. So you can either just donate or you can get one of the rewards, which is, for example, a limited edition DVD of the movie, um, or you can even be in the movie, um, all kinds of stuff, whatever you wish for. And also, if you would like to, you can get a Skype session with me as a thank you. I don't know if I'm that interested on it's interesting of a person. I just thought of ways. You are very up. interesting and very inspiring. Oh, it's so cute. Yeah. Thank you. I just try to think of ways to come up to mm-hmm. say thank you. So if you are involved in an eating disorder yourself or you have somebody who might enjoy a conversation with me, um, just donate to the movie and then we're going to Skype like this and we can talk about whatever you want. It would be my pleasure. Oh, they will love that. Absolutely love that. Who wouldn't want to Skype you and talk to you? You're just such oh, a beautiful person. You, you really oh. are. really are. You've got like so much, like you're really soulful. Uh, yeah, it's, you're just beautiful inside and out. You know, you can see your skin's glowing, your eyes glowing. You're just like, it's that just beaming. You know, it's wonderful, wonderful to see. Really, really nice. It's and... a good, you know, this beam, it's a good mix between just being happy and nutrition. So That's... both both things I didn't have before. So um, it's, it, it changes you in many ways to recover. You, you really want to get there. Well, Sarah, thank you very, very much for doing the interview with us. It's been You're so welcome. Anytime. Wonderful. Yeah, absolutely wonderful.